Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, brought to you by Advancing Analytics, your friendly neighborhood engineering and AI consultancy. And it's time for another Databricks News Roundup. And yes, I know, it's been a couple of months once again since we did our last one. I kind of assumed there wasn't that much going on in June, because we had the Data AI Summit, and we did a roundup for the Data AI Summit. And then as I was prepping today's video, going through all of the release notes for June and July, turns out there's quite a lot of stuff. So, yeah, as usual, we're going to grab the release notes. We're going to use the Azure flavor. So as always, make sure you use the flavor for your cloud provider that you're using and just have a step through, see what things we care about, see what things I don't really care about, and have a talk about how it affects you and maybe have a quick play with some things if we've got some time. That's the plan. So, yeah, as always, if you're new around here, don't forget to like and subscribe. And let's have a look at it. So... On the Azure flavor of the release notes, I'm on June 2024. I've got the, uh, the July 2024 ones lined up as well. And as always, you're going to whip right down to the bottom. And then we can just go from there. Because, you know, chronological, right? It's good to start at the beginning. So, yeah, let's have a step through and see what we actually care about. So, new Databricks UI. Actually, you can go through the notebooks. It's a lot cleaner than it used to be. That makes sense. But you've probably now had that for two months. So hopefully that's not too big a thing. A new ODBC driver's got some interesting changes in there. It's worth keeping up if you're using it heavily. Um, little nice quality of life feature. Being able to access the catalog directly by hovering on top of a table name in there, which is actually quite useful. So if you happen to be in a cell, you've got a table name, you hover over it and link directly to the catalog explorer, which is super, super useful. Markdown's gotten a little bit better. So if you're writing some markdown, so you previously you'd write some markdown, then step off the cell, and then you'd see what you'd just written, and be like, oh, no, that's not right. No, that's not right. Oh, that's not right. Whereas now it's actually just, it gives you a little live preview as you go and do it, much like the, the Fabric one does. Uh, so yeah, just useful to go and see how that works. Database Assistant, now just threads and queries by default. So like if you think ChatGPT, and you've got various different conversations, and you can go back to previous conversations and see the various different uh, chats you had in there, same experience thing now with Databricks Assistant. So you'll basically each time you work with it, it'll open up a new thread and you can see the various different conversations you've had in that context window for that thread. That's now enabled by default. You can go and use that. Super useful. Uh, you've got general text embedding. So basically a way of uh, creating vector embeddings is now available through Databricks, uh, which is one of the so models posted in the hugging face you can have a look at. Uh, but essentially, yeah, if you want to create text embeddings, uh, that is now just supported inside of uh, the Mosaic AI model serving, which is cool. Um, the Mosaic AI vector search previously only did uh, like some uh, semantic searching, uh, which now you can kind of do two things. So you can do just like exact match searching, like a classical search. Does it have this exact string in there, as well as doing the more vector-based semantic similarity search? Uh, and it now just combines the two of them together. So super useful, makes it way, way uh, just more powerful in terms of how it works. Uh, it's an interesting one. So you've got this. Uh, <laughs> this is very weird. You've got the vector search functionality. I think the documentation is slightly wrong. We talk about AI forecast later in the docs. There's actually this thing called vector search, which is uh, put out as a new function. Let's go and grab the docs for that. Essentially, much of that, if you've created the vector search index using DataRex, you can go into Unity Catalog, right click on a Delta table and say, create me a vector search index on top of this. Um, and they can go and query that now directly from in SQL. So what this is about, we've got this new vector search uh, functionality. We can go, hey, I want to do a new search. This is the, the vector search index, the VSI that I'm trying to query. This is my query input. This is how many results I want to get back. And you'll get a result set. So you can use it like a search engine and just say, hey, look, if I was to go and do a vector search for this term, what are the various records I would get back? Uh, that's now something you can just do straight in SQL. Pretty cool. It, use it as a lateral. Some interesting stuff you've got baked into that. Uh, yeah, not, not AI forecast. AI forecast is a different thing that we'll look at in a second. I uh, got a thing called function calling you can now do. So, this is a technique when you're using large language models. If you want not it to just give you a response, so it looks like an actual big load of text answer, but actually, if you want the large language model to generate essentially something you would send on to another function. Essentially, if you wanted to call an API for you, that's kind of what function calling is. 
So we dig into that. You can see it's kind of um, when you're trying to get to do things like send an email, pull the current weather, and you're giving that function definition. So you then say, right, here's some function definitions. Give me a response I can pass straight into it. So you can see you get this kind of thing. You said a tool. I dive to the things. There we go. So we've got a tool which is defining a function. It tells what the parameters are. It says how it works. And then inside my the thing I'm kind of you know pinging off to go and get, get a response. I'm saying this is what my tool, tools are. Pick which tool to use, and then give me the well formatted response that I can just pass straight into that tool. So kind of like the well when you're building these agent frameworks, when you're trying to make a large language model actually just use a pre built things to go and make other decisions. So if every time it sends an email, it shouldn't have to figure out how to send an email. Just call the send email function. That's what we've now got in terms of this function calling that we're seeing being built in. Very cool. Like an evolution of large language models to these kind of agents that can break something down into a list of tasks and then do some of it. Some of which is interacting with other systems and real world objects or real world objects, other APIs, other functions, things like that. Uh, you got the workflow system tables uh, being renamed as to the lake flow tables. Uh, so you can now go and do that. So you're having a look at various different uh, um, things. System tables, again, if you haven't used system tables, absolutely use system tables. Uh, there are these things that essentially give you the full telemetry of everything going on in your Databricks account. So if you want to know who's got access to a certain thing and has been what notebooks they've been running, uh, how much you're going to be charged, you know, billing information about compute that you've used, if you want to know what queries people have run, all of these things are becoming available as system tables. So you can query basically about your Databricks usage. Loads of good stuff in there. So workflow tables are now available as the lake flow scheme. Uh, column mappings are, are now GA, which is good. Um, you can disable it if you want to get rid of it. Um, so you just need to turn it off if you don't want it. But that's that thing where it gives you an abstraction layer over... Well, this is what the schema looks like. This is what the parquet files actually look like. So you can protect yourself from schema change a little bit more easily, mainly about schema renamings and that kind of stuff. Uh, model serving allows you to support uh, firewalls, which is good because being able to not being allowed to model serve because you have firewalls was a bit a bit weird. So it's good that we can now do that when you've got um, your storage account is actually properly secure. Um, got this thing called root optimization in uh, serving endpoints. Essentially, it will skip a few of the authentication barriers and just go directly to the endpoint. So if you need to have something, so if you're using model serving, you've stood up some kind of large language model or your traditional uh, machine learning model, and you're using data model serving to stand that up, and it has to go fast. We're talking about, you know, real high latency, just low latency. Low latency. <laughs> this has to be very, very, very quick in terms of its response. Then root optimization is that you can turn on. Now, there are some network limitations. I think it skips. It won't use private link. It'll just be public. Be careful with it, but it's something you can turn on if you want things to go super, super fast. Uh, predictive optimization is this thing where if we have a managed table inside of Unity Catalog, so we said, you know what? Databricks Unity Catalog, I'm happy for you to decide the naming convention for the files and folders in my lake. I just want you guys to look after it. Predictive optimization will just occasionally optimize it for us. So if we don't want to even have to write any maintenance jobs for our lake, and turn on predictive optimization, use managed tables, and it'll start actually doing that for us on a regular cadence. Pretty cool. Uh, Mosaic AI agent framework is a whole video in itself to go through. There is a lot of stuff in there. Um, that is essentially this whole move towards agentic uh, like some models. Essentially, that thing I was saying, where I give it an instruction, it breaks it down into a list of tasks and it uses other, essentially a mixture of large language models to actually go and work something out. And that can be using tools and calling other functions. And we're seeing a lot of those things now start to appear in terms of Databricks functionality. If we look at Genie and it looks like a pre-baked, pre-wrapped agent framework uh, actually going. So there's a whole load of tools baked into this all about... If I asked it a question and it broke it down into several steps and then it executed those steps, which included running some SQL, getting the results back, interpreting the results, writing the results out somewhere else, showing me what that happened, all of those kind of things, I want to be able to see, well, what steps did you take? How did you make that decision? What SQL did you write when you did it? All of that um, evaluation and looking at it and kind of the, the history of what's actually happened and why it made certain decisions, that's the hard bit in that. 
And so the agent framework has all of those things built into it to help you actually build uh, the agentic models, to help you actually figure out how to productionize them properly. So they're parameterized, they're operationalized, they're doing logging into telemetry to be able to go and actually review it and actually look at the feedback and look at what worked and the process of those, building those tools saying, here's something that sent an email. Here's something that logs and requested to Slack. Here's something that will, I don't know, write a certain bit of SQL, but I want to save the SQL so you always use the same SQL each time. All baked into that stuff, which is very, very cool, but that's a whole different video, so we'll come to that. Um, you can now provide your own uh, encryption keys for vector search. Okay. Cool. Uh, volume sharing using delta sharing is now available. So this is something we kind of knew that was coming because we've seen it with things like Shutterstock. So previously, delta sharing was originally just delta tables and then expanded to be delta tables and maybe a machine learning model as well. Uh, and now you can also do volume. So if you just have a, a lake folder full of unstructured data, be it images, be it MP3 files, be it videos, be it text documents, whatever it happens to be, and you still want to use delta sharing with that, you can now do that by registering that as a volume and then using delta sharing on top of that volume. Just how in the data marketplace, you can now go and get Shutterstock images if you want to do a load of image training, that is now available, which is very cool. Okay, Lakehouse Monitoring is now GA. Lakehouse Monitoring is this thing where we can go into Unity Catalog, click on a Delta table, and say, oh, can we just like measure the data quality? I want you to regularly poll this table and see if it has drifted from its original schema, if the, the shape of the data, the percentage of nulls, the kind of um, the distribution of values has changed over time. I originally geared a little bit towards kind of uh, feature tables and things they would use for a training machine learning model, but you can also now start using it for various different data quality things. Now, some limitations, that's such as needing serverless and needing some things turned on for that to actually work, but it's really cool. Pretty good. Okay, billing system tables now just turn on by default, so you should just see billing appear as a schema in a lot of your Unity catalogs, so you'll start seeing that information. Query it. Um, just a general, if you are using secure uh, connectivity and you've got all uh, the NCCs properly set up, you'll actually need to go through and actually be applying that because they are changing. Go and have a look. Is that a warning bell to you? If you're using a heavily networked and secure DataWorks environment, you probably want to go and take a look. Although that probably broke, uh, yeah, a month or two ago. So don't worry. Um, okay. If you're in Unity Catalog, you're create, uh, creating catalogs. Let me improve the, uh, the interface for that. Sure. There's a new idea of geos. So this idea of if you're using any of the baked in AI elements, where your questions and your prompts and your information will actually go in terms of the, essentially the geographic boundaries of that. So now for a lot of these services that are these things, the foundation models, model training, using Databricks IQ, using Databricks Assistant, all of those things, Essentially, you've now got this whole idea of going, there are these boundaries of which geo it will live in. It won't leave that geo if you're using these services. But previously, some of it was just, this is going to get processed in the States if you're using this particular thing. As now it's much, much stricter. So you can see actually which of the different things are actually been baked in. And some of those things simply aren't available over here yet. They just, <laughs> you cannot use it in those regions anyway. Uh, so there's a bit of a mix between where different things actually live. Kind of curious if UK South is in the EU data boundary, but if that things happens, that means it might not. We'll see. Okay, so that's Geos, that's now GA. Uh, there is a new runtime. We're going to leave the runtime to the end. We might even do those in a separate video, depending on how long we go for. So many platform changes to go through. Um, there's a now quick way of doing an Azure DataWorks workflow. You can just do a quick... Oh, just run every two hours, every five hours, every what happens. Just a super quick way of doing that, which is nice. And there's this new thing, the Databricks Debugging Console. Uh, have I got this open already? There we go. So this idea of being actually in the Python context or in the context of the current execution in the cell, if you use a breakpoint, so you're kind of paused in the middle of it, you can actually just evaluate other things in the middle of that uh, thing. So actually at this point, if I did this to this variable, what does that actually look like? So we can kind of run many jobs at the state of a paused breakpointed bit of code. So again, super useful. It's the kind of thing you can do in a lot of classic, um, 
local development environments. And it's great that we're seeing more of this stuff baked into the actual uh, dev environment proper. So, yeah. Very cool. I also keep speaking to people who never use the variable explorer. Just use it. It's now in there. You get this full list of all the variables that are active inside your Python session. Go. Use that thing. Uh, cool. Uh, we can now, if you're using serverless, if you're specifically using serverless notebooks, uh, so you've got a notebook, you've said, I don't want to use a cluster, I just want to use serverless. Uh, you can now go in, there's a library management, dependencies management thing that's now available in, in under environments. So go and use that. Now that Dataworks Assistant has threads, it now gives titles to threads, which is with ChatGPT. Cool. And the Dataworks Assistant is now GA. Again, so you can now do all these things that we were doing previously. It's now you can trust it a little bit more on this better support and you've got the availability behind it. Very cool. Um, with Mosaic AI model serving, previously, if we had a machine learning model and we said, right, go serve that, it would spin up a single serving, single node compute. Essentially, it spins up a tiny VM and it serves that model via there. If I had a second machine learning model, I would have to spin up a second bit of compute, two different VMs. Uh, now, a lot of the time, that's fine if the latency of those uh, endpoints just needs that amount of compute behind it. But occasionally, I don't. But occasionally, I need to have it there. If anyone clicks that button, it has to be up, it has to be ready. But actually, the load is quite small. Maybe I've got four or five different machine learning models, and actually, I can just want to bundle them all on the same little small VM, because it's only going to be calling things occasionally, and the main point is uptime. We can now do that. So you can have multiple models on a single model serving endpoint, which is pretty cool. Uh, Catalog Explorer has gotten better. They've just tidied it up. The UI has changed. You might have seen that happen over the last month or so. Uh, change to how Databricks works if something breaks. If you're in a notebook and you run something and it comes back with an error, it'll now automatically use the assistant to actually diagnose that and suggest what the problem is. So it's not the comes back with the error, you click a button, you have to say, yes, can the assistant please go and diagnose that for me? Then it does it. It's just going to do it automatically. It's going to assume that you do want the assistant to help you. That is now turned on by default. Finally, if you are an absolute mad person writing some code and you try and use a variable and you actually define that variable later, that's not going to work. It'll now type that syntax and say you're doing a silly thing. Obviously, it wouldn't have done that previously. It would just tell you when you try and run it. I don't know what that thing is. You've not defined what DF is yet. What is that? Um, that is now baked in. So, yeah, no, surprising amount of stuff actually happening in June, given it was Data AI Summit Month. And I was spending my time talking about all the big new announcements and features and things. Actually, huge amount of stuff happening in the platform itself. Obviously, lots of things going GA in line with the summit. But yeah, lots of other stuff actually happening. Cool. Right. Let's take a dive in the other direction. Let's go and dive into the July changes and see what's actually going on in here. So a whole bunch of stuff actually happening. So right down here. Okay. One. Same again. It now diagnoses errors automatically. Now running the fix. Actually change the code rather than just diagnose it, which is cool. I've uh, got some resource quotas. So if you previously were using Unity Catalog and you were like, ah, oh, I've got a million tables I want to fit in here. Why can't I? Well, now you can. I don't know who actually was going over the 100,000 table limit, uh, but apparently somebody was. So now you can. Okay, that's a thing. Um, there's a new Skim API, so if you're using uh, Skim, you can actually go and do that, which is it's an auto-weighted way of uh, syncing identity management. So if you're trying to push people like automatically over from Entra into your Databricks account, it's 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 how you manage that. Um, Databricks Assistant system tables now available. So those system tables that are so important to give you so much telemetry, you can now run it for the Databricks Assistant. So you can see all the different events, all the different queries, what's actually happening, who's interacting with it. Are people using it? What are people using it for? Are they using it to diagnose errors, to write code? Are they just asking you questions about its day? You can now actually go and look at that via the data assistant system table. Super useful. Uh, Lakehouse Federation now supports Salesforce Data Cloud. So Lakehouse Federation is that ability for us to hook other things up into Unity Catalog. So previously we could do it for things like a SQL server. So I can say, well, that SQL Server, just make that part of Unity Catalog. And then people can browse it as if they were Delta tables in my lake, was actually they're just looking at the tables and schemas from the database itself. And any queries get pushed back to that source. 
We can now do that with Salesforce Data Cloud. So if you've got a load of data in Salesforce and you want to make that available, you can now do that if you're using SDZ. Pretty cool. A lot of people use that for ETL as well. You can just use that as the starting point and then select from there into your like, I mean, as long as you've got things networked properly, Salesforce is fairly easy to do. Pretty cool. Here we go. This is the second time we've seen that AI forecast uh, function. This is actually for the AI forecast function. Now, this is to do with forecasting time series. And I got super excited when I saw this because there's a whole thing at the moment which is kind of uh, in vogue, which is time series GPT or time GPT. Essentially using log large language models to do time series forecasting. Now, I will say this is not that. So having got this AI forecast function, it's one of those... Um, things that we've seen a lot of recently in terms of in Databricks SQL, we can use the AI query function, the AI translate, all that kind of stuff to call a large language model and make some predictions for us. This is a similar thing where we can say, well, select from AI forecast and it will return a table of data. This is a, a tabular function um, that goes off and extends and forecasts based on some stuff. The important thing right down at the bottom is based on a profit-like linear and seasonality model. It's not actually using uh, a large language model, it's not passing it back uh, to go and do that forecasting. So you need to be aware it's not quite the same. If you've seen time GPT, that kind of stuff, it's not doing the same thing, but it is incredibly easy to use. So in this case, yeah, I've got a little CTE with some dates. They're saying, okay, well, take that date, uh, use AI forecast, pass in that table and move my, kind of, uh, my CTE in there, tell it the dates I'm looking for, tell it, what to use as the actual time value, and say what you want to forecast. Super easy. I basically extend this table until this date using, and this is the thing I want you to forecast. Super, super easy to do forecasting now baked into just SQL. And that's that's great, right? Now, a lot of that stuff is just, again, democratizing, using AI to do some smart stuff, but doing it just to the SQL level just makes life a lot easier. We can have it baked into our queries, views, we can use it in all those things. Nice and easy. Yeah. Uh, external models, we can now actually provide API uh, keys as secrets, which is um, We can put filters in. So more and more, we're able to filter things using natural language. Show me only this certain things. So if you're using Debit Assistant, it's now better uh, actually sort of um, doing filtering and that kind of stuff for us. We can actually just go and, again, just baked into the result sets of our table inside a notebook, go, oh, could you just like, Filter that for me. So it's just part of the result set now. We can just, instead of having to say, you know, filter this column to this value, just type what you want. It works there, which is all pretty cool. Okay, uh, Deliver Connect now supports serverless. So if you are using serverless for notebooks, you can now do that via VS Code locally using Deliver Connect, and you can just run that against a serverless thing rather than have to run it against a specific uh, Spark cluster. Very cool. Brings us on to serverless is now GA. Again, another thing hot on the heels of the Data AI Summit. Uh, so serverless compute for notebooks going GA, serverless compute for workflows going GA. So if you now create a workflow, rather than saying, hey, this is the job cluster, spin this job cluster up and use it for the rest of this workflow. Now you can say, make it serverless. And it'll just decide what, it, what compute it should run, decide how to actually execute that throughout of that processing window. Same thing for notebooks. If I'm in a notebook now, I can just open a notebook and go, you know what, just, just connect, make it serverless. I'll drag this in. So if I'm in here, I'm in my notebook, I can just go, use it serverless. Now you won't see that unless you have enabled that feature. So despite it being GA, it still has to be turned on at your account level. Just dive and manage this account. I go into my settings, go into feature enablement, I have to have turned this thing on at my Databricks account level for this to work. So if you're looking at that and you go into your notebook and you don't see serverless in this dropdown because it hasn't been turned on at the account level. But yeah, it just means rather than any of this stuff, I can just go print, hello. So it'll still have to create an execution contact and a, a context and a session. Goes off, says, can I have a server, please? Comes back, runs the thing I've asked it to run. There you go. Four seconds from having nothing to having requested, stood up a serverless cluster, ran it, and this is in a notebook. So this, we kind of got used to this behavior in SQL warehouses. I'm used to in SQL endpoints doing this kind of stuff. The fact I can now do it just for any old notebook I fancy, pretty cool. And we saw earlier, we can now do things like attach libraries to it. So it's not just like, it has to be the most basic thing you're doing in the world. 
you can do quite a lot of stuff, which is very cool. Okay, um, there's better partition management if you're using non-delta tables with uh, Unity Catalog. Big question for me, why are you using non-delta tables with Unity Catalog? So good, but also just use delta, come on. Um, vulnerability scans, you, build, you can turn on uh, vulnerability scans, which is like this enhanced security monitoring thing. Uh, and that previously, if you wanted to get the breakdown of it, you had to ring Databricks and say, could you send it to me? Now it'll automatically be emailed to you, which is nice. Makes a lot of sense. Um, we've got the query history system table. So if you go to a SQL warehouse and you can have a look at the history table, you got all the different queries that have been ran previously, which is super useful. Whereas now, actually, you can do a thing. Okay. Uh, you can do a thing where actually you get the full history as a system table that you can query. So you can bake into all of your different queries. I think you just do some analysis on this is, these are all the different times people have accessed certain tables. This is the SQL logic they used against those tables. This is who's been writing which different bits of SQL all available via system tables now, which is incredibly, incredibly useful. Okay, delta sharing. You can now use share tables that use a liquid clustering that was previously disabled. So if you had, essentially, if there's just a little bit of a lag when they put new features into Delta and it raises the Delta read protocol, there's a little bit of lag before Delta sharing supports that. It can now support liquid clustered tables. If you ever called something in your workspace and included a slash in the name, it previously let you and it shouldn't let you, and now it doesn't let you. You can't do that anymore. It just makes sense. I get it. Uh, and yeah, Llama 3.1 is now supported in model serving. So if you're in a region that has model serving, you will now see this as one of the foundation models that are available to go, to go and use. So you can bring it in, you can use it, you can tie it into stuff. Again, you won't see it if your particular region that your workspace is in doesn't support foundation models. But very cool. Quite hot, hot off the heels of uh, 3.0. And that's replaced that. Um, this is super interesting. I'm definitely doing a follow-up uh, follow uh, video on this. So you've got this node timeline system table. So essentially it is a log minute by minute utilization for the all purpose and jobs compute. So if you want a full breakdown as to what happened on my cluster and how much was I using it from a like memory network compute, the kind of things you could previously see in Gangly and you can see on my compute metrics against this uh, thing. If you want that available as a just a data table that you can write SQL queries against and do mappings of usage over time, that is now available in preview as one of the system tables with just a whole bunch of stuff inside that you can do. So your CPU percentage, your memory percentages, your network percentages. So much information in there. There's lots of stuff we can use that for. Change the single user uh, compute. Previously, certain security things weren't enabled on it. Uh, and now you can do it, but it kind of passes some of it off to servers. You need to be aware of that and you need to have serverless fully configured for it to work. Uh, but yeah, certain things like views where you don't have privileges, dynamic views, role of security, column masking, all that stuff uh, will now work, but it was unsupported for previous versions. So yeah, a slight, it feels like a workaround you to use servers to get over that stuff so it actually works, but that is now available. Uh, Scala is now GA if you're using uh, shared compute and Unity Catalog that are previously not allowed. Uh, now you can with 15.4 and above. There is the new 15.4 runtime. That's fine. Um, again, different video. We'll run through those two new times. Where this has gone on for a long time already. Um, yeah, it's new JB and even newer JDBC driver using the OSS stuff, which is pretty cool. Um, you can now share comments and primary key constraints using Delta Sharing. So if you were sharing a bunch of tables via Delta sharing, they wouldn't get that additional metadata. They wouldn't get the fact that these tables were actually related and how they related to each other. So that metadata is now going to be shared only for things you create after July 25th. Not long, not long ago. Uh, so if you have been using Delta sharing and you're sharing a bunch of stuff and you set up Unity Catalog properly and documented things and set up all your relationships, you need to recreate, re-add those shares and then it will actually then start sharing it out again. They'll start getting that stuff. So, so you need to re-grant them access, and then they'll, they'll suddenly get that stuff. Model sharing is now GA for Delta sharing. We saw it in preview previously. Now you can do it properly. Now you can have a bit of trust over it. You can use it without worrying too much. Um, single sign-on for Lakehouse Federation SQL Server. So if you're using Lakehouse Federation, you've attached a SQL Server, you can now use single sign-on to allow people to actually go and connect to it. 
very cool if you're using intra uh, authentication all the way through to log into Dynamics. They've got intra authentication to that SQL DB. It can just use single sign on and pass that through. Very cool. For some reason, they've extended 9.1 support. And if you're still on 9.1, stop it. Don't, don't be on 9.1. That is ancient and you're not getting any of the more mod benefits of uh, Dynamics. So you sh really shouldn't be on 9.1 anymore. Um, another minor network change. Uh, it's to do more with the allow list of what you've got kind of, uh, for external connectivity. So you need to be careful about things. It'll now time out if you've spent more than two hours trying to install a single library onto a cluster. Cool. I mean, yeah, that was always a bad thing if it was still doing that. Uh, there's a change to some of the Git folders. So if you haven't seen it yet, Git folders is the new way of doing um, Git repo uh, kind of stuff inside of Databricks. So we had this idea called repos. So it's a separate folder. You have workspaces and then repos, and then you'd add your various repos into that repos area. And I'm moving away from that now, and just inside your workspace, you can add a folder and say, this is a git back folder. This associates to that repo, that branch. This associates to that repo, that branch. Uh, there's a few issues in terms of if it went wrong, if you need to reset your credentials and all that kind of stuff. So it's just some nice um, quality of life, user behavior, bug fixy kind of things in here just to make life a lot easier and make it easier to see what's changed and more user-friendly. Bunch of stuff in there. Um, Dynamic Assistant, which is pretty great at finding things inside a notebook and saying, well, that's gone wrong. And as we've seen, is now automatically fixing those things that have gone wrong. Now I'm going to start doing the same for jobs. If a job breaks, there's an error in there. Dynamic Assistant is going to go and have a look and do a diagnose and just say, this is why this job broke. Again, it just makes support much easier. It makes it easier for people to open it, go, oh, that failed. I just get a nice explanation as to why it failed using Databricks Assistant. A better rollout of uh, Mosaic AI Agent Framework. Still not in Europe. One day we'll see it in Europe. <laughs> but that's kind of moving out. It's now available in North Central and Central US. Uh, sharing schemas is now possible using Delta sharing. So previously we had to say, create a new share at that table, and that table, and that table, and that table. I just add those objects into our share. Now we can just add anything in that schema. And then if I go in and add further, further tables into that schema, they'll automatically be included in that share. Yep. Incredibly useful, super useful for building that stuff out. Uh, can now, again, go to the Databricks Assistant activities. Same thing. It's another thing. Yep. System tables are very useful. <laughs> I use that a lot. Uh, support for Cloudflare, Cloudflare R2 storage. So if you are using um, Azure Data Lake Store, if you're using S3 buckets, if you're using any kind of data lake storage currently, they all have egress charges. Now Cloudflare R2 doesn't have egress charges. So if you want to put your data somewhere, have your data look and feel like a lake, but have various other people coming into it from outside of your environment and reading data out of it. If you did that via one of the cloud native ones, you'd get charged a lot of egress fees. Each, bit of, each time a bit of data leaves, you get charged an amount of egress fee according to how much data was sent. Cloudflare R2 doesn't have that. So if you're trying to do Delta sharing, if you're trying to have just a set up share, and that's going to have a lot of those things, then that's now something you can do. Uh, Lakeflow Connect, one of the biggest announcements coming from the Data AI Summit, that is available in gated public preview. So you can go to this thing, you can go and request access, say, could I be added to the preview, please? Um, essentially, you need to talk to your Databricks account managers. So if you're using Databricks as a customer, you probably have an, a, a, some kind of commercial team, an account exec, someone you can go and speak to, and they are the people you need to ask to go on that preview currently. And obviously, they're looking for interesting use cases. They're looking for people who are going to use it a lot, people with lots of different things to try and do. So I don't know how I'm assuming they have been flooded with requests for people to join. I don't have access to it yet. When I've got access, I will be doing a video, don't you worry. Um, yeah. If you see the workflow schema, it used to be called the workflow, it's now called Lakeflow. Weirdly, we saw that earlier in the release notes, so they've retrospectively gone back and changed that. But yes, if you see something called the Lakeflow system table, that is all of your workflow information goes into there. Uh, and yeah, finally, we've got this new thing. I think to end on a nerdy one. You've got the command palette now available inside of notebooks. Command palette is something we're, we're used to seeing in things like um, uh, VS Code. So you've got this Control-Shift-P, 
gives you this command palette of a load of different default things you can go to. It's the way a lot of uh, modern coding IDEs work, because they assume we're all nerds who don't know how to use a mouse, and so we'll just use co uh, keyboard shortcuts. So if you want to be able to get to change to the dark theme, the light theme, just shortcuts to make just general settings around your workspace, the environment, to get to various other places, to go to the DataWorks community and go to the Q&A knowledge base there. Loads and loads of different things you can do from here. So that is Control-Shift-P now. Uh, if you're in uh, Windows, I think it's very similar. It's the same. Con uh, Command-Shift-P or Control-Shift-P, depending on whether you're on Windows or Mac. And that will open that command palette in the notebook, and that should be rolled out everywhere it is now. Oh, what? So, appreciate. That was very long, and there's lots and lots of things in there. There's two whole runtimes we've not even looked at yet, but there's a huge amount of changes in there. Now, some of them are just nice UI, quality of life, make things a little bit nicer for you to work with. Some of them are networking security changes that if you didn't see, if you broke things, and now hopefully you fixed them anyway. So, you know, I'll be all right. Super interesting, the number of serverless things coming. Serverless going GA and being able to use serverless against notebooks is fairly huge. There's a lot of stuff in there, but remember, it does have to be set up properly. And things like agent frameworks are a massive, massive paradigm shift in terms of how we're actually building AI-driven applications. So huge, huge number of things actually bubbled in there. Some of them were big data AI summer announcements. Some of it just quietly snuck, snuck in. And they were kind of hidden by all the fanfare about the new stuff coming. But actually, some of these great things that were in there just kind of snuck in without you seeing it. So do take a look. As always, run through the notes yourself. Don't take my word for things. Read things yourself and see what's useful for you. And yeah, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll catch you next time. Cheers.